Hi, everybody. How you doing? Hello. Hi. Um, you might imagine that uh, I'm kind of excited about this idea of uh, interviewing the guy who built R2D2, but I mean, you know, this is uh, going to do some introductory stuff initially here. Um, just to give you some sense of uh, what this uh, conversation is um, about. So this is both the keynote to the We Robot 2015 conference on, on robotics law and policy, which has been taking place today and will be, take place also tomorrow here at the law school in this room. Um, but it's also the distinguished lecture series from the Tech Policy Lab. The Tech Policy Lab is an interdisciplinary unit uh, here on campus that bridges um, <coughs> computer science, uh, information science, and the law school. Uh, as well as uh, electrical engineering, uh, where we have an affiliate uh, a professor. Um, and we have a dozen law students who come from these different, uh, a dozen students, excuse me, that come from these different areas. We have a couple law students, a couple electrical, electrical engineering PhDs, um, candidates, as well as computer science and, and information science. Um, and uh, basically, we, we work on things that would be difficult, uh, to, problems that would be difficult to solve by reference to any one discipline. Um, and we have a distinguished lecture series, uh, and we've invited uh, our guest tonight uh, to, be, to be the distinguished lecturer for, for this quarter. Um, and so, uh, you know, many of you know exactly who this is, but this is Tony Dyson, um, and he is, um, hello, Tony, yeah, wave, wave to the crowd, Tony. Hi, 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 hi! <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, he is an Emmy-nominated special effects supervisor, uh, uh, among other things on, uh, if you can imagine, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. This is a movie from the early 80s. Do you guys say it's a, uh, anyway. Um, sorry, Tony. Uh, and so then, uh, and then also Moonraker, like as in Bond, special effects uh, supervisor James for that. James Bond. As in James Bond, as in James <laughs> Bond. Uh, Superman 2. Uh, and so, um, just, just to give you a sense, of, those of you who are uh, 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 Doctor Who fans, I'm sure there's a couple of people that are Doctor Who fans in here. I don't know if anyone's a Doctor Who fan, but maybe, maybe one or two, right? So in, in the lab, where, where we, uh, the physical facility we have, I got Tony in there, and there's this Dalek cutout in the lab, okay? And we're joking, but you, you might find that, you know, good sense of humor, you may detect that eventually. Um, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> Get up, get up. <laughs> and I point over to this. I, I said, "Whatever you do, Tony, it's fine. You know, this is you know this is your space, but um, you know don't upset the Dalek." I say to him, and he turns over and he looks at it and he goes, "Oh, I worked on that." <laughs> and you're like, it "Oh, just, wow, yeah." <laughs> it just proves how old I am, you know. I mean, come on already. Or it maybe proves that the dialects are very old, because I was actually quite. Quite small when I worked on it. Is that right? Yeah, you were you were you were in your early teens. I was, 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 was. Um, and so uh, and so, of course. So now, in addition to, to being a, a, an absolute legend in special effects, of course, um, you know he he's a roboticist. He, he's a, a he, he built R two D two for for Star Wars, which you know was a robot that um, just to give you a sense of its significance, if you're not aware of it, is in the Smithsonian. You know what I mean? And so he built that. Um, uh, but but then he also has worked all over the world. Um, uh, for major companies and artists and theme parks uh, building robots. Um, and he is here all the way from what? The island of Crete, right? You're, you're like in, in, he flew via Malta to Paris here Malta. to be with us. Yeah. Malta. Um, I did live in Crete, but now I live in Malta. Now you're in Malta, yeah. exactly. Um, and so, Tony, I just want to say I, I'm just so deeply honored to, to have you here today. So thank you so much for making Shucks. the trip. <laughs> yes. And thanks Thank all you. of you for Thank coming you. out. Um, and so I, I have a, a bunch of questions for, for Tony, and then uh, uh, I'm sure you do too. And so um, I think we're going to jump, jump right into it. Um, uh, and the first question is a question that some of us have been sort of talking about for a while, including today at the conference. Um, and it's the idea of, you know, what the, what the hell is a robot? Like, what makes a robot a robot? When you think of yourself as a roboticist as opposed to some other special effects, right? I mean, what, what or, 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 or machine you're building, um, you know, for you, what, what's a robot in your view? Hmm. Was that on the list? It was on the list, I Are swear. Sure? Yeah. <laughs> We've been having a running joke for about four days plus a week, I think. Uh, have you got your list? Have you got a list of questions? Have you got your list of questions? Um, and I don't remember that one. Oh. Um, okay, ro what is a robot? I don't know. It's very tricky to say what a robot is. We know that robot obviously means slave. We all know that. And we know it's supposed to be a slave. If it's supposed to be a slave, that's good enough. 
So any intelligent machine is a slave, so any intelligent machine is a robot. If we're going to be specific about where the name comes from, um, for me what a robot is, is a little bit more than just a machine. It's something that um, is coming close to the intelligence side without actually being AI. It's something that's going to be doing, obviously, a job for us, as a slave would do. And that would really be what I would think a robot is. Um, I think there's some really intelligent machines in factories these days. I don't know if you ever take the time to actually go around some of the modern factories. You should do. And these machines are massive, but they do beautiful work. And they're, they're not just fixed on one target anymore. They actually can be programmed. So we're talking about machines that don't look like robots, not even industrial robots. And they, they are robots but they actually are threat and considered as just intelligent machines. It's getting very blurry there. So if it's a slave and it works for us and it's mechanical and it can be programmed, it's a robot. So how did you end up getting into robotics in the first place? I mean, you got into robotics even earlier than the sort of uh, craze around robots in the 80s. I mean, how did you <coughs> end up getting into robotics? Totally and utterly accidentally. <laughs> 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 Isn't that the best way? Isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it was R2-D2, funny enough. Uh, I wanted to work in the film studios, and I went down there. Do you want me to tell that little story or not? It's interesting. Whichever story you yeah, want to tell, yeah, man. This yeah? is, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <sighs> do we want to I'll tell the story of you okay. building R2-D2? <laughs> sure. <Yeah>. I, wa <laughs> I wanted to work in the film studio, and my parents were away at the weekend. My sister worked for the telephone exchange. In them days, we're going back a long time. You actually used to pick up the phone and someone would just say, number please. <laughs> well, my, well, something with a higher voice than that. But anyway, my sister actually did that job. And she rang me back uh, at home, I was by myself that weekend. And she said, I found Pinewood Studio. Now, I don't think it was lost, but to us, we didn't know where it was, you know. And she told me exactly how to get there on the M40. So I got on my scooter as a mod. If anybody remembers mods and rockers. Yes, good girl. <laughs> <laughs> could be talking to myself for a while now. Got my scooter, dashed down there, found Pinewood Studios. It was owned by Rank Xerox, or Rank um, uh, Corporation. There's this big muscular man with a bong. Anyway, he's outside there. I went up to the guard. I said, I want to work in the studio. I'm not going to tell you what he said. <laughs> it's blue, 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 blue. And I got on my bike, and I was really pissed off, and I, I came home. Uh, and actually, the skies opened up, and it was like God was saying, you silly boy. And I got so bad that I got back home. And that was my first attempt at 18 to actually work at the film studios. A couple of years later, I started to make a rocking horse. You know, these rocking horses? Victorian rocking horses? Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep, great. <laughs> a very large one, pretty expensive. And it was also incredibly difficult to make because it was made in GRP, right? Uh, plastic reinforced uh, glass the kind of make racing cars and that kind of thing. Uh, and it was closed. So how do you get a brush in there to put the resin if it's a closed mold? Pretty tricky, right? Yeah. I'm glad they're concentrating. I'm asking questions <laughs> later. <laughs> they better. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a clever way of making it. Let's put it that way. The molding was clever. Okay? Ingenious even. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I rang up uh, a small studio. Instead of ringing up Pinewood, I rang up Bray Studio. Hands up, anybody's ever heard of Bray Studios? Great. Oh, Bill has. Anybody? Wow. You're a genius. British. What did he say? <laughs> he, said, he said British. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Woohoo! Same thing as genius. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Bray Studio is where you used to make all the horror films. Hammer Horror. You've heard of the Hammer Horror films, Dracula. Oh, my God, what am I talking to you? Uh, and that's where I used to make them all. And I rung them up, and I rung them up, and I rung them up. And I kept getting the same dragon on the telephone. That's what they call them affectionately in the UK. If you get this person that says, no, you can't, I'm not here, have a good appointment. They're called dragons. And I kept on ringing and ringing and ringing. Eventually, after about a week, she must have felt sorry for me. She put me through to another building, and I was again lucky. And I got a guy who said, you want to work here? I said, yes. He said, uh, I've got a green card. I said, no. He said, how can you work on films without a green card? Green card is a union card, not a card to come into America. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so I said, how do you get a union card? They said, you have to work on a film. 
how do you work on a film? <laughs> You've got to have a green card. <laughs> so uh, I was getting a bit little upset by then. That's a, a nice way to put it, right? And he said, don't worry. I said, I am worried. He said, don't worry. There's a new um, fad, we thought at the time, called special effects. And the reason for special effects appearing, how many people know how and why special effects came into existence? No, don't put your hand up. It's very complicated. <laughs> oh, you do. Forget it. <laughs> There's always a smart ass, isn't there? I think he probably heard, heard it from you, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'll ask you later. Um, no, tell us now. Tell us now. Go on, get on the mic. Tell us now. Is that mic turned on? <laughs> what was the guess? What did he say? He said he was going to speculate. Um, the origin of special effects? I mean, I mean, I think of like Fritz Lang and Metropolis when I think of special effects in the early Oh, uh, yeah, days. going back that far. Yeah, yeah not that's bad. As far back as I there was just too many things going on. You know, the, the director was actually taking care of models. Uh -huh. He was taking a matte glass uh -huh. where you actually do paintings on. Uh -huh. Explosive, makeup, model making, the lot. Uh, and it became an incredible long list of things that the director had to undertake. And they were getting fed up of it because she couldn't cope with it all. And of course the actors as well, you know, don't forget the actors. So they decided to pass it over to somebody else. Okay? Now I know this has nothing to do with robotics. Like you please, you came. <coughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> so what happened was he said, look, they're doing this and we don't really need a license because we we'll actually do it outside of the framework. Now it's getting exciting, right? Whoa. So I said, right, what do I do next? He said, I'll introduce you to some people, come down to Bray Studio. I went down there. And they were making uh, films you probably don't know, it's just secondary films. Do you remember Alien? <laughs> <laughs> they were making Alien down at Bray Studio. Now you remember Bray Studio, won't you? Right, right. So actually they were making Alien, they were making Space 1999 down there as well, which you won't probably remember. Um, and I met a couple of top guys in special effects. And I said, wow. He said, yes. I said, wow, again. And we did that for about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're fans of the trade. And I sh he said, have you got anything you can show me? I said, like what? He said, something you've made. I'm thinking, oh my God. The rocking horse I started to make. Well, I didn't tell you. I actually didn't finish it. It was nearly finished. It was in my garden. It was in my garage. And it wasn't painted. So I actually spent the next week painting it without a spray booth and tipping it. Black, by the way, black horse. And letting the paint flow down and flow. <laughs> and then go back in the garage and then five hours later and that, uh, that went all on all week. It looked gorgeous when it was finished. As long as nobody put their nail into it. Um, got it all finished, looking gorgeous, red rockers, fantastic, if I say so myself. Took it down to the studio and he was my first guy, the special effects guy, Brian down there. They actually bought my first rocking horse. Isn't that cool? And he said, I think I have a film coming up soon for you using your special moulding. Because you see, that's when he noticed that the raw horse was made a closed mould. And so he went, clever, right? <laughs> so I said, OK, what's, what's going to happen in between? You know, you've got a film coming. I've sold you my horse. We're buddies now. What's going to happen? He said, go down to Pinewood. I'm not going to Pinewood again. <laughs> that man made me say. <laughs> he said, you went through the main gate. I said, yeah. Oh, God, bun. <laughs> Everybody's a critic. <laughs> so I said, where do I go? He said, the second gate. And just tip your hat to the guard and you'll think he knows you. I did it. So there I am in my minivan with, <laughs> with another horse in the back in case I meet somebody. You never know, do you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting down there, he opened the gate up. I went, well, up, mm, no, we're up, and drove in. Now, Pinewood Studio is exactly like a Hollywood studio. There's all these people walking around in funny dress. Really cool, like it's a Saturday night on the, on the town. And there's this great big building that said James Bond 007. Well, come on. I mean, I was a fan, wasn't I? I was still a kid. I mean, you know what? And there's Bond film and there's, oh, 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 oh. So I spent about four hours walking around the whole of Pinewood, trying to find somebody that would talk to me because I wanted some work. And they actually, Brian did tell me to go and see a guy called Derek Meddings. Now, Derek Medding has got all the awards you can actually... He's passed away now. But he had all the awards you can think of working on Bond films. I found him in the back lot, doing what all good special effects guys do, playing with his remote control toy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. It was actually the film Moonraker. And he was actually making a model and seeing how it would actually work. 
So I showed him the picture and I told him I had a R2D, uh, I had a, um, <laughs> I had a rocking horse in the back of the car and he loved what I had to show him. I had photographs, of course. Photographs. We had photographs. Not digital, but we had photographs in them days. <laughs> and he said, I've got a film coming up called Moonraker, James Bond. I'm just doing some tests on it. Would you like to do some model work for it? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so he gave me all the models in Moonraker. You haven't got a slide for Moonraker, have you? I don't have a slide, yeah. We haven't sorry. got any slides. I don't think we have any slides, yeah. We didn't plan uh, for any slides. Should I get... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no room service, no slides. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? A university or something? A, a lot of people, a lot of people have, uh, have probably seen, seen the film. So, yeah. what, so what kind Don't of models? Worry did you, yourself. It's okay. What, kind, what kind of models did you do? I mean, yeah. stay put. we did all the space models with the lasers on the back mm -hmm. and the helmets and the silver suits and all that. You know, the kind of thing people say. How do you go to the toilet? Those kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did all of those, right? And that was my first film, working on James Bond. What? And then they said to me... Yeah, I'm do you mind, get... Mary? If you, yeah, it'd be, we welcome you to do it, yeah. What's that? Sure. What's that? She wants to maybe look up... You're going to find it on the web. Oh, Brill. I love you, I love you. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's, it's all, that's by the way... Modern just, technology. Recommendation. Be... Always bring a librarian to any conference that you do because they will, they will literally find... She's, Mary's been doing this all day. People will reference some paper and then Mary will just find it and tweet it. It's a, it's like a fantastic it. thing. So, so great. that was my first film. And then, of course, I went back again to find out what he was talking about, and it turned out to be uh, Star Wars. And again, the closed mold principle came into effect. So that was the first robot I made. Your question was nothing to do with this whatsoever. It was, how do I get into robotics? Well, no, I, I, when I asked well, I how, really how, how you got sort of into robotics, so it sounds like what happened was that you were doing sort of great work for film, and they needed someone to do, to, yeah. to do a robot. But then you, you, you subsequently... Well, tell us about that. I mean, so that process was eventually... You had to make not just the one robot, but you made a bunch exactly. of them. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, tell I us about that. Yeah, I making robots. And it looked like I could make them well, basically. You know, like, you tend to want to specialize. But well, if you've got any common sense, you do. Come on. So what happened when I made R2, and it, people seemed to like it. So you, you made it for... for um, so I moved on to more robots. You, you, made it for the fir you made it for the first Star Wars, but then you ended up taking over special effects supervision for subsequent... Uh, well, yeah, on Empire Strikes Back, which I think is probably meant to be one of the best ever made of the Star Wars group. Um, it's my favorite. I don't know about you guys, but Empire Strikes Back is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah! So what about, is, this, is this from, uh, from <laughs> Moonraker? There you go. Good job. There's the my models. There's my models. Yeah. Drax Corporation was the baddie. Well done, love. Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> there you go, kids. Cool. Good, good, good. So that was the first film I actually worked on. Can you believe that? Talk about toiling down the top and working downwards, right? There's the R2-D2, another goodie, right? So I decided that really robots were the next big thing. They had to be. But everybody kept turning around and looking at uh, 3CPO, another golden figure, and saying, there's an actor in there, there's an actor in there. Yes, so... So what I did next, as you know, is I actually made the Philips robot, or Android. And I cut away the waste to show them there's nobody inside this one. <laughs> right? But I actually made it on spec, if you know what on spec means. I did all the research work myself, because there was no, 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 no servos, no electronic uh, equipment to actually make it work. It really was very rudimentary. So I did all the research work to actually make an Android, to get it to work. Arms, hands, head even the waist. Then I took that to the advertising agencies and said, guess what, I've got this Android, what do you think? And Philip said, hmm, very cool. The Dutch, they all talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually gave me the contract for uh, the actual robot to change it, put a U, to put their symbol in the middle. <laughs> and they said, would you like to take it around the country for three years? I said, can I have a car? <laughs> it's a big bugger, yeah. And I got the contract to take it around the country and to take it to the Ideal Home exhibition for a month. That's a big exhibition we have in London. And that's when I found out the uncanny. Well, that that, that, that's right. I mean, so, so the question is, so we've been talking a lot uh, about um, the way people react to, yeah. to, to, ro to robots um, and, and, and the fact that, that something like an Android. I mean, I think just to go back to R2 for just a second, you know, something like R2... <coughs> uh, and this is from uh, uh, Clive Th uh, Thompson's uh, pe piece in the Smithsonian that I sent you, Smithsonian yes, Magazine. Yes. You know, one nice of the things, page. yeah, w one of the things Clive says about about R two is the fact that um, it kind of avoids some of the some of the you know uh, uncanny valley. 
issues because it's obviously got a lot of personality and it's obviously got a, you know, something to connect us, uh, but it, it doesn't purport to be mm. like a human, right? And, and I, I remember um, we, we've talked about the fact that, that uh, wh where, where does that come from? I mean, have you ever sort of thought about what is it about you know, R2-D2 that uh, makes it one of the most sort of lovable robots of all time, oh, cool. um, and, and then maybe contrast that to the Philips robot, yeah. Yeah, I have, and I won't tell anybody what it is because I don't want anybody else doing another one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm mad, crazy, what? But, uh, so you know I, the secret sauce, but you're not gonna not share the recipe. Yeah. No, right. no, 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 no. But actually, I did have some ideas, but not totally. So when I made the Android, um, I made him a nice figure. The girls like his bottom, unbelievable. I mean, disgusting, really. <laughs> they kept going, oh, he's got a lovely bottom, hasn't he? Oh, yes, he has a nice little bottom. Um, but I had it cut away, and I had motors in there, so I was telling you. And so it actually stood on a stand. Stands are always good if you're standing. Don't you think standards are good when you're standing? Yeah? And it actually would actually be like this, you know, just like a normal robot, right? And then it would actually bend and actually twist. But as soon as it bent, everybody went, ooh. <laughs> Everybody moved back in one go. This is at the Ideal Home Exhibition. So it would go, are you all right? Yes, that would go, good. <laughs> and they'd all move back again. <laughs> so it didn't take us very long, you know, we're not that thick, that they don't actually like it bending forward. So actually I had to took out that motor and the twisting motor and ended up with the arms, head, and uh, flashing lights with its eyes. Uh, and it went around for three years. But that was a true Android. It was actually... Uh, computerized, and we actually used the uh, actor to do the motions and then put it into the sequence. We used uh, yeah, blah, 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 BBC computer. Just shows you how far back that was. <laughs> well done. The, the phenomenon, <laughs> but the phenomenon you're describing, I mean, I, I observed it like tonight. In other words, uh, there, I mean, no offense to uh, Maya and the computer science uh, folks here, but I had, I had my own students, uh, uh, tort students from this year. They were passing through and they saw that what we're doing and so <laughs> forth. And, um, and uh, they, they looked at R2-D2 and they were like, oh my God, it's so cute, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, it's great and everything. And they, th then they looked over the PR2, which is this advanced research platform with two arms and like, you know, all the sensors and the thing. And, and they were just sort of like, whoa, that's a little bit creepy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so even something that, um, you know, the, 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 it's not like, uh, at least in the, in the movies, you know, uh, R2 can, can do all these different kinds of things. Right. And in fact, in a way, C-3PO didn't really creep people out almost. <laughs> no, I think it because of that really buffed a voice. Is that what it was? <laughs> it was sort of like the fact oh, that he was what do you mean? Really, R2? You are silly, R2. Maybe. You think it was disarming, the fact that the voice was, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. I mean, come I thought, on I thought, Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, I, could it scare you? I'll let you run back. You know, it doesn't really work to actually scare you, but it doesn't. So, so tell us this. So, <laughs> so, in so having done uh, robots for movies, um, and having done them for companies, and it was and Philips wasn't the only company you built r robots with, right? For My own right? Um, no, I mean for industrial, like for 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 for, for like for like you know Sony or Philips. Like, what was the difference, I guess, between building robots for Hollywood and, build, and building and building and building them for companies? Was there a real uh, difference in your mind? Real. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the films, obviously we all know now because we just discussed it with our gentleman back there. But it's special effects. So with R two, anything went. Some were remote controls, some had a small actor inside, some were empty and throwaways, some were pulled with a piece of rope. Not telling you which ones. Um, <laughs> it's all special effects. You're told to get a job done. Now, I was lucky. I mean, in everything that comes out sometimes, well, not everything, but lots of things in life that turn out to be remarkable. Now, everybody here, I hope, thinks that R2 is quite remarkable. Yes? yes? Right. Thank you very much. I wasn't looking for compliments. I was trying to tell you that it's always an element of oddity or luck that makes it happen. As it turns out with R2-D2, we didn't have the money to actually put all the uh, <laughs> activators in the legs. You wouldn't know it, but those legs have got springs inside them for the two-legged version. And that's why Kenny goes, or R2 goes, and he actually springs on these very powerful springs in the legs. Now, officially at the beginning, when I was designed, I wanted it to actually have activators, so they would go at the same time as twisting the head. It just wasn't possible to do it. We didn't have the money, we didn't have the time, we just ran out. Special effects, can't do it right, or can't do it the way you would think of the first all, do something else. So we've got Kenny inside. 
Now, that was the biggest, best thing I ever did in my life. Because Kenny brought personality. He's an actor. Right? Now, now we could make it happen. Because we'd have an actor with a skeleton on him. He would do it. That would go into the computer. And that would be put into the, the robot. Same thing in the end. Still getting the same thing. We're getting that element, that special element of human in, into it. Well, one, one thing we've been talking about a lot is, uh, the, uh, some of us, uh, is the difference between having a sort of physical, embodied, actual, literal robot right there uh, versus the idea of having some virtual presence, you know, something that was uh, just software or, you know, just, just visual. Um, and, and today, the way we do, we do a lot of the special effects with robots is, is obviously through uh, computer graphics, right? Um, and so when you're referring to a skeleton, I assume you mean you know, you put this full body thing on and it senses and then it reproduces it literally as a, a computer generated. Yeah. And, you've, and you've done some work in, in, in computer generated graphics, haven't quite, you, Maurice? Quite a bit of work, yeah. So uh, what about that transition? Has that been an interesting one from you know, physically building stuff, which I know you still do, but also but going from that to the sort of virtual universe, what's that yeah. been like? It, it, it all comes down to you know, really very simple things. The simple thing is, it's a job to do, do you get satisfaction or not? Now a lot of directors do not get satisfaction with green screen or computer graphics. Mm. Green screen is where you put the, the graphics on, where you project it onto the film itself, right? Um, it's got nothing to do with anything else except can you get on with it or not? Now a lot of actors can't get on with green screen, a lot of directors can't get on with it. Mm. And on the other side of the story, people overdo it when it comes to graphics because they can. But of course we know that all the time in films, don't we? If you look at the first films, Star Wars films, how personal they were, as the films went on they got out of control. Too much, too much. I actually uh, tell my five-year-old that there were only the first three films. So, and, <laughs> and, yeah. And, 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 yeah, absolutely, and, and, absolutely. And, and, absolutely. Also, there's, there's only one Matrix movie, but let's just set that aside for a moment. Um, but it's true. Yeah, uh, they, they get over the top. But that's nothing, you know. Uh, we all know that anyway. We all you know that situation. But do but you enjoy doing animation? I mean, do you enjoy animation as a as an art as an artist? Oh God, yes. I enjoy it because I can be on the right side of it and then pop over to the other side. You, know, you can play around with it. I like just making anything imaginary come true, if I can do. But at the moment, of course, I'm working on all kinds of projects. I mean, I write children's books about fairies. Fairies with wings. <laughs> to be clear, yeah. Um, look out for bobbikins. <laughs> I've got bobbikins as well. I write about bobbikins, little bounce characters. So, so <laughs> you, you, you cannot have failed to notice as a, as a person um, with such a history with, with robotics that, uh, you know, it has really captured the, the public imagination, I mean, uh, today. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, people are it seems like it's in the news all the time, we have conferences like this one, right. and so forth. Um, you know, but, but of course, uh, you know, Star Wars uh, came out in the late 70s, early 80s, um, and that was a time in America, uh, at least, um, where uh, you know, we really kind of had caught robot fever. In other words, the, you know, for, um, th many of you, of course, were, were, uh, experienced that, and, and you experienced that. Um, uh, you know, uh, do, you, do, you have any, did you, do you have any sense of whether our fascination with robots today is any different than it was in the 80s, or do you think it's the same? Or what, 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 are there any differences? No, the only difference now is that we've been promised them so long, it's a little bit like shouting wolf. People are getting, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll be the same, we'll get them. Now, we all know how strong and fantastic robots are at this moment in time. Everybody here probably doesn't know half what's going on, and the rest know a little more than the rest. So it's huge, big time. But the general public see a little bit, see a little bit, see a little bit. And they're going to say to themselves, yeah, yeah, we've heard this all the time. Now, why are we always fascinated with robots? It goes back a thousands of years. The reason we love robots is we all want to have a slave. That's it. Is that what you think it is? I know it's, it's the fact I mean, that you want you someone to argue. do your will. Is that what it is? Hmm. Because it goes right back to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, R2. Sorry, R2 disagreeing with us here. Back but, I mean, to your so, pen. Back to your pen. Well, you, you, what, is what you're saying? Let me say it back to you and see if this is what you mean. I mean, is what, is what you mean that we, we all want someone to to solve our problems, do our will, or whatever it happens to be? I mean, is that That's you pretty know, cool? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I work as a slave for my wife, or did, so why can't I have one as well? Yeah, yeah. But that, I think basically that's it. We all would like to have somebody or something we can say, please do that for us, please do that for us, please do that for us. If it's not true, why do people have maids and butlers when they have enough money to afford it? I mean, come on, it's human nature. That's it, simple. Go and wash your own clothes and say you're happy. 
Go and do your own ironing. Go and do the washing up but, without a washing machine. Yeah. But then, but of course, people are also simultaneously afraid of this technology, right? I mean, as you talked about, when, once you, you, all you have to do is get it to lean toward people and they back away and get uh, frightened. And, and, and people today are worried about robots taking their jobs and so forth. So uh, I'm just pushing back. By the way, this is a, for those of you in academia, you know, uh, we have our own our words that we use and one of them is pushing back. I mean, pushing back, all right? And that's, that's just pushing back. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I'm just pushing back on that just to say, uh, Tony, that like, you know, that, is that enough to explain why we simultaneously are fascinated by these things, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but at the same time, fearful of them, right? I mean, it, um, it's on two different levels. The fact we're fascinated because mankind is making them and they are fun. They're fun to watch and we think, wow, aren't they clever? They're fun because, as I told you, deep down, we really would like to have slaves to do the hard work so we can go off and play with the fairies and play with the, uh, the trees and the flowers and mm. smell the roses. Because that's what we really want to do. And you, you get on with the hard work and we'll have a good time, right? That's in the back of us. So that's the basis of it all. But if you come back then to saying, oh, robots can take our jobs, they can. But let's be honest about it. If every job is taken by every robot, who's going to have the money to buy the goods that the robots make? There's that famous story <laughs> about, about someone talking to, to Ford. Does anyone remember that story? Um, I'm going to get it wrong. Where someone was going to Henry Ford and, and was showing off all of his... All of his Robots and do you know that story, Kate? I don't know if you're if you're laughing about that, but this is a great story. Like it's like Henry Ford like has all this automation and so forth, and he's showing it off to some other person, and someone says, um, "Henry, um, who exactly is going to buy all these cars that you're making?" Right? And so there's this idea that if we substitute ourselves too much, and so, um, exactly. so um, I, I want to take you back to one thing. So when when you t you have looked at some of the uh, robotics labs uh, here on on campus. Yep. Um, and you went over to, uh, to see some folks over at Intellectual Ventures that have a big lab there, um, which, is, which apparently is pretty sweet. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, what your lab uh, was like um, uh, you know, in, 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 in the 80s and, and so forth when you, were, when you were doing a lot of the special effects work. Presumably it wasn't just you. You probably had a bunch of people working with you and you had a physical space. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Could you tell us what your lab was like? My lab was very much like the lab I saw yesterday. I opened the door and went, wow! <laughs> <laughs> Everything was everywhere. But <laughs> uh, I felt like saying to all the guys, I, I'm clear out the table, like, what do you think, Peggy? And then you move out over there. <laughs> huh. And then he jumped as well, because I did it once, and they actually started to do it. I thought, oh, I haven't lost a touch. Wonderful. Um, it was great. But there was some really modern equipment there. I mean, of course, they had... Uh, does everybody in love with the, the printers, physical printers? <gasps> 3D printers. <laughs> they go, oh, come on, you've got to be in love with them. They can do anything, for God's sake. I mean, they're going to think they're going to print food soon. Um, that's not funny. It's true they were doing that there. <laughs> yeah, well, we can cook. We enjoy cooking. And the rest of the family can eat the printed stuff. Um, it was really cool. Uh, the whole principle of actually printing whatever you want. And the best bit is when they actually print something that you can't actually make because there's something trapped inside it. Yeah, gears, plastic gears inside there. You can actually move the gears, but there's no way it could have got inside there except you printed it inside there. Is that cool or what? You can actually do with that with metal. Um, the component can be made of any material you want. Differential from plastic to rubber. I mean, it just blows your mind. But, but presumably, when you were working, for instance, on uh, some of this stuff, I mean, you must have done a lot of kind of uh, MacGyver kind of, you know, making things work by. With duct tape and gum yeah. and stuff like well, that, right? I mean, yeah, you duct know. tape was for outside of the things we made because I never right. trust the bloody thing; it'll all drop apart. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the hard work was actually spending all your profits on trying to build circuits and equipment because it wasn't on the market. Mm. And then when you go to see this kind of equipment, yeah, yeah, have a little bit of a. <sighs> if only we had had these three D yeah, printers exactly. when I was doing this stuff. Things yeah. you could do with this stuff. I mean, well, you can definitely print robots for sure. Fab. Although I have to say that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the films that you worked on, um, they hold up pretty well. I mean, if you yeah. look at them today, I mean, maybe it's that physicality. Maybe it's the fact that a lot of the stuff was like actually literally there. Um, but it, it holds up well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I yeah. think that when I see some of the, the androids, mm -hmm. when I see some of the androids on, on film, and I see what they're doing in the labs now, and I think 30 years ago I was doing androids that had full motion and then a lot better head movement than they've got at the present moment. So it all comes down to intent and design. I mean, I drove my team crazy. Yes, we can do it. No, we can't. Yes, we can do it. <laughs> and they were, at the end, they'll do it. 
You know, we would actually make it happen. But at the time, they thought I was totally nuts. Now, of course, they know I am. <laughs> and I give in now. I don't care to argue, you know, down with it. So, yes, go back to your question. Walking around that lab, I was like... <laughs> all this lovely equipment. I mean, it was just blowing my mind. But I'm, I am interested, because you're going to actually tell them about my... Other project is coming up. Well, you? actually, that's what I was going to ask you about, Tony, actually, uh, coincidentally. And I also want to, of course, <laughs> leave uh, time for, for audience questions, too, for, for plenty of them. Um, but my understanding is that you're, you're thinking about getting into the drone business. Yes. Um, and uh, you have a sort of particular take um, on it. And uh, Tony and I were talking about this, but you know, obviously a lot of us are thinking a lot about the drone industry. Uh, we have uh, one of the top experts in... in we have, we have two, actually, of the top experts here, because we have Margot, too, and, and Greg, uh, on, on sort of American drone uh, policy. Um, and, uh, and we also have people like, um, uh, you know, the, the editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine quitting Wired Magazine to form his own drone company, right? And so there's a sense that, that this is a transformative technology and it's kind of one of the leaders. But you have, I think, kind of a unique take on it. And so, so what, what, what was your idea and what, what are you working on? Right. I'm putting together a startup company called Green Drones. And the idea is not so much green to the planet, but to the point of saving people's lives. There is so many different experiments all around the world. A little uh, project here, a little project there, helping to um, rescue, search and rescue, uh, disasters, going to do snowfalls, finding people buried under the snow, going in the desert, there's a company that's been running for three or four years now, actually finding somebody that's silly enough to walk away from their car, and end up in the desert, so they're making a drone to go and find it, or a competition to make it happen, and so on. Also mine sweeping as well. So it gets to a point where there's all these different things happening, that people want to have a go, want to build, trying to build, um, what I say, a help robot, you know, one that will help and save lives. But it's never really coming together, never really getting together. So I thought, to hell with this. I got excited reading about it, I thought, I can do it. So I want to have one company that makes green drones that are programmed, totally programmed, by the way, no, none of that, totally autonomous, uh, which you just say, go, find, rescue, bring back, follow your inner master, and that's it. So, so, so they'd have to do. So they would have a set of. Uh, that, that sounds very exciting. I mean, so they would have a set. Just to help me understand, they would have a set of pre-programming activity. I mean, you could you could use the motto um, uh, "Do no evil." I don't think it's being used right now for anything. Um, but you could, anyway. <laughs> but how, how do you how do you police how do you police against that? I mean, in other words, most of us think about drones as being platforms that could be used to to deliver bombs, or they could be used to do bad things and good things and so forth. How, how would you ensure that your green drones would be only be used small for good? Drones. Yeah, but even so, but even so, I mean, by making them small can't be the way that you keep them good, right? And so, in other words, you know, do you have a sense of how do you position yourself in the market and how do you design these things to, sh to, to, to make sure they have this pro-social sort of uh, goal that I think is a very valid one? I mean, in fact, um, we have some students who, who, who have been working on um, sort of drones for humanity that we... Uh, yeah, sure. Sam, I don't know who's... Are you still working on, on drones for humanity? But some folks here are doing that. Um, Okay. Yeah. If it comes so, so yeah. So what do you so what do you think? Yeah. If it comes down to that, this would have, <coughs> these robots or these drones would have to actually be developed uh, probably outside the states anyway, because at the moment you've got to apply for a special license, as you know. If a drone's out of sight, if it goes too high, if it's got a bigger payload, blah 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 blah. Now I'm not necessarily saying that's bad. What I'm saying is even to develop it, I wouldn't be interested after finding the finance for it, because we're looking for about five million for the whole project. Hmm. Uh, I don't want them to spend another couple of years trying to get a license. Duh. That's not going to happen. I want to take this outside of America, make sure we actually produce it, even if it's investors from America. And by the time we've got it working, I know then we can show them the finished product and get the licenses for it. Even US companies are testing their drones abroad there's, right there's now. There's quite a few yeah. companies doing exactly what I've just told you. So it's not like it's new. They're doing exactly that. They're not getting the license or even trying to half the time. They're just going outside the country, developing what they have to. Now, I'll be doing the exact same thing. Also including, by the way, there's all the other countries that people are, have a problem with. So it's not just you know, saving lives in, in America. It's saving lives in the rest of the world. But what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is if someone were to come <coughs> to you and say, um, I, I, I want to uh, uh, buy or, or license or use a bunch of your drones, 
a Tony, but I want to do it to like keep tabs on peaceful protesters or drop tear gas on them. Are you saying you'd be like, no, because my company is about good uses, is what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say. I like the idea of that. The principles will be put forward on that, on that basis mm. um, as far as it goes. But do remember at the same time, for five grand, you can buy a pretty powerful early uh, a drone and do what the hell you want with it. Yeah. So you don't really need mine. And then if you're going to do something bad with it, you don't even need to make it autonomous. Because remember, I'm specializing in it being autonomous. Specializing in that you don't change its batteries, it does it for it. And it goes out and does its job until it's finished. Well, that was one of the innovations I thought was really interesting, was the idea that um, you'd have a technology that, um, where the drone would actually go swap its own battery yep. out. So it could, it, could, it, could, it could do autonomous operations, but then <coughs> through, through clever design, the drone would be able to come back, uh, swap a battery, and then continue, and continue on. Exactly. Um, and just carry on. Yeah. I mean, that where we don't have to worry about, uh, as I said, it's like saying to R2-D2, go and win, win, kill them all, you know. Um, make us free, make us free. You're telling R2 to go and do something. That's the way a robot should be. Get a, a project done. We're telling the drone to do the same thing. The drone will be designed, software, and the uh, sensors to do particular jobs. Obviously, you know, you plug which one it's going to work for. If in the snow or the Alps, it has to be. I mean, if you're going, let's say, for in Australia, we've been asked to actually make a, um, a shark guard. So from one end of the, uh, the beach, it flies right to the very far end, looking at the water to see if it recognizes a shark that's come through the net. And it comes back again. Now, that version of the uh, drone is slightly different, simply because it has to be resistant against salt water. Right? It has to be. Well, so, you know, salt spray everywhere. But it's a beautiful idea, and we definitely can do that. No question about it. Can go down one way, come back up a little bit further in the water, and just go back and forward and then change its battery and go back and forward. Um, it's going to save lives. It's great. Terrific. And there's lots and lots of things like that. And there are lots of places. I mean, in the Amazon, uh, we can actually have one of our drones. Again, it's not specifically saving life directly, but it can actually find and film on the top of the uh, canopy, where we know there's different animals up there which haven't been found yet, but it's extremely difficult to go up there. A couple of years ago, they were using balloons, hot air balloons. Again, incredibly difficult to get them out there. But with our kind of drone, no problem. They can come back, change batteries, go and film. Come back, change batteries, go and film. Just let them to get on with it. I'm going to make a, a, one observation, and then I want to open it up for questions. And so <coughs> what we've been doing is having people queue up uh, in, front of the, um, in front of the microphones here. And before you ask a question, it would be great if you could identify who you, who you are. Um, we're sort of, sort of uh, keeping tabs on um, uh, different kinds of people and disciplines and backgrounds and everything else. So that'd be, that'd be really great. But let me make an observation that obviously, you know, you're a person who is, uh, without question, of course, been working on robotics for a long time. Yep. You've been working on it uh, and since the late 70s. Um, and, <coughs> and, here, and here we are, though, now in, in 2015, and you're thinking to yourself, uh, after an illustrious uh, career in, in various aspects of robotics, I think it's time to, to build these robots that are able to do some of these tasks and make a business of it. And that's very interesting and very typical in a way, because today, uh, sophisticated people about robotics are actually thinking, how can I turn this into a business? And that differs itself, differs, I think, in many ways from, from uh, uh, what was going on in the 80s and sort of people were interested right. in, in robotics. Um, so uh, I, I want to give you, of course, a chance to make any other comments that you want to make, but I also want to make sure folks are able to, in the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or 12 minutes, and ask you questions if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Very clever, not giving them too, too much time. That's I don't want to give them too much time because I have too many questions. <laughs> well, um, but everything I've made in robots has always been a business anyway. So it's not that special. It's just that I've looked at it and realized that it's an imagination, all you need, good imagination, to make robots stand out. Doesn't matter what field you're in, uh, robots need imagination. It's part of the whole package. And I've got a good imagination. So when I see something he's doing, and I see I can do it, I want to get in there and do it. That was really the end of that bit. Yeah. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, questions for Tony, <laughs> come on, please. Yeah. Round of applause first, and then questions. Uh, Dave Chapin, UW. I'm curious about commercial applications for drones. So Just a sec. Can we turn that mic up, somebody? Because I can't actually hear it. But I'm Hello? actually going Is that down. better? So uh, we oh, know great. that the military is an application. We know that agriculture is another one. What other applications do you see for drones? Oh, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it would depend which drones we're talking about. And if we're talking about the green drones or the ones I'm doing, there's a few more left over. Uh, when it comes to drones, drones, there's no end to them. I learned about one recently, which I, 
well, you may know, you may not know, but they check aircraft every time they've had so many flights to find out if there's any dents on the side of them. And they go up on ladders. So now they're using a drone and a laser. Small helicopter drone is just literally flying around it and putting a laser back and forward. I mean, is that cool or what? That's a good one. There's no end to the things you can do with small drones. Seriously. All you need is your imagination. Now, I'm not going to go into that film myself because I want to specifically be in a particular film, but I could take my drawers and actually use them in other fields to do this kind of work. But they are cool, aren't they? Thanks for the question. <laughs> Not automated, huh? <laughs> Speaking of, um, Joanne Pransky, world's first robotic psychiatrist, so it's finally after all these decades, wonderful to meet you. I have to ask you, what is R2-D2's greatest psychological problem that you think? You're probably looking for work, right? Oh, well, yeah. Well, at first I thought it would be R2-D2, but after his definition of a robot, I thought maybe you and I could talk at the end, you know. So, so I, I don't know if you know, R2 is uh, D2's deepest psychological problem. What do you think? Was that a psychological problem or technical problem? Psycho psychological. What you think his greatest psychological problem is. Psychological, it, not His problem or mine? <laughs> well, you know, this gets back to what is robotic psychiatry. It's like pet psychiatry or child psychology, but I didn't really want to say it directly, but that's why I'm asking this indirect question in the hopes that I can analyze more about what you said as robots being designed as slaves. So, yeah, his greatest psychological that you would think, and then we'll get into that some other time. Yeah, it'll cost you more, yeah. There's a whole line of robots I haven't treated yet. Are yeah. you the lady that gave me the card that said the first the robot psychologist? Am I what? The first robot psychologist. I am the first world's first robotic psychiatrist. I was dubbed by Isaac Asimov in 1989. Yes, right. It's the real Susan Calvin. Okay, lovely one, yes. There was a question there somewhere, wasn't there? Well, let's, 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 let's put it this way. Okay, so, and so. I, I thought I had postmenopause. Come on up here. I love meeting you as well, sweetheart. Honestly, honestly, honestly. Okay, I did. here's the question again. Okay. Oh, what do you two. think R2-D2's greatest psychological problem is or was? Try again. Um, so uh, what is R2-D2's greatest psychological problem? So if, if R2-D2 <coughs> were like a person, what psychological problem do you think R2-D2 has? Oh, okay, okay. Not being appreciated as saving the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, what, what about what about what about the uh, the question that, that that wasn't asked? But what what were some of the? I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what are the worst technical technical problems were. I mean, what were some of the real technological hurdles that you had to deal with? Uh, oh, yeah. I think the one I was telling you earlier on about making it into a um, a, a skin job. I think I was explaining a closed mold idea. Now, of course, you can get your hand by taking the, the dome off and get your hand in there, right? But the problem is if you make that in um, aluminum it becomes extremely heavy. Uh, if you ask the gentleman that's made this clone, you'll find that if he was trying to use the batteries we had 30 years ago, with the weight that uh, robot is, it would never move. Seriously, it would be in serious trouble. Um, so we actually had to make it in GRP. So we made a couple of versions in aluminum, the arms were in aluminum, but the body itself was actually in GRP. Hmm. But when you have GRP like that, it's got no strength. I'm blowing, boing, 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 like a tin can, with an open top. So what I did is I made internal molding and then put foam, hard foam down that gap. So it's actually a layer like a house, you know, of insulation. Then you can't bend it. Perfect. So that was a big, big challenge. The, again, the domes, we weren't in aluminium because they were too heavy. So we have to take that to a vacuum and vacuum, uh, <coughs> not vacuum form it, but actually use a vacuum uh, metal, you melt metal in a vacuum and it covers the whole dome. So it was made in uh, epoxy. And, 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 and. And it's also bloody complicated. <laughs> I mean, there's so many panels to make in thermoplastic, in fiberglass, in aluminium. Um, it's like this one's in brilliant, this, this, this little robot here. So lots and lots of challenges. But if it's not a challenge, it's not worth doing, is it? <laughs> right? Okay. P Peter? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Peter Saro, <laughs> New School, Princeton. Um, so... I want to know, we had a panel earlier today talking about design, and I kind of want to ask you about the design of R2-D2. And So how much of that design was sort of given to you with sketches or forms, and how much of that did you come up with yourself, and how did you think through, I mean, it's, it's such an iconic form. 
for so so many people and for science fiction and for literature and film and it's an amazing form, right? <laughs> so how did that form come about? What what things did you have to kind of work through on the aesthetics, not the technicals, but the aesthetics of like how it moved, how the lights flash, uh, that that allowed it to sort of be a, a actor and a character in the film. I always feel like I cheat people when they want to express themselves fully and totally, and my answer is it was teamwork. You know, my answer's that long, and their question's that long, and I feel like somehow I'm cheating. So I do apologize. But, but, but how did the team get there? That's what I want to know. I never know how they did it, because I thought there were a load of <laughs> friends. <clears throat> well, where, did, um, where did it start? That was teamwork. We had the basic design, the sketches first of all done from the studio. Then I took them and readapted those. Then we found we couldn't actually put uh, a lot of the um, mechanics inside the inside leg, which is what we wanted to do. Because the whole idea was to make it look like it was totally out of control, uh, engineer-wise. You know, you've got the smooth 3CPO, but you've got this over-engineered uh, sidekick. So it really came around, the finished item came around because of how we could make it, how, what was practical, and so on and so on. So, you know, again, it's special effects, and nobody can turn around and say, that's not exactly where we thought it would be. Just, what about the sound, though, or the sound and lights? Oh, where the did the sound, sound come from? Yeah. We were talking about the sound earlier on. That was amazing. Because that was a group, and it was taken under Shepard and Studios. We were playing around with it. And normally you could turn around afterwards and say, oh, God, you said, spent too much time on a silly sound. Don't be so daft. But this wasn't too much time on a silly sound. The sound is just perfect. It doesn't scare you. It doesn't frighten you. It makes you think, oh. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. And did it, so they tried a bunch of different things until they got it? Or, do you, I mean, was it... Uh, because... You know, we think about iterative design, about trying something out, and you can see from this photograph that, uh, you know, I, I know that's, that... That's my studio, by the way, kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, I, I made this joke b b before, and, and I didn't realize that it was going to land so, so poorly, but I'm going to make it again, uh, which was it's sort of like uh, child actors, where you have to have twins or triplets so that you can only <laughs> use one of them at a time, and then, uh, uh, and then they get used up, and you've got to bring the other one in or whatever. But was it like that, or was there just different scenes required different... Units. You see Every what I mean? scene, yes. Okay. Yes, it was the second part of your um, mm. uh, statement there. Um, we had Kenny in some of them. We had a throwaway in another one. When I was down the studio, we were actually putting in <coughs> a plunger. Uh, I think in the second film, we're in the bog planet. And R2 pops into the mud and mire, right? And he's spit out by, by a monster. We've just got two minutes. I'll tell you a little story. Can I tell him a little story? Tell him a little story. Nothing yeah. to do with robotics, but down the studio story. When I was down there in the Bog Planet, everybody knows the Bog Planet had Empire Strikes Back? Yes? Everybody knows that? It's when uh, Yoda goes and says, Use the force! Use the force! <laughs> don't try, do! So I was like, my school teacher. <laughs> so I'm down there, I'm helping them out, you know, because I was at my studio, because my studio was outside of the main one. I had 40 people working for me in my studio. And sometimes I would sneak off, leave them to do the slave work, and go to the studio studio, right? Where the fun was happening. And this was a great studio because it was locked down because some snakes escaped. We had snakes in the Bog Planet and they weren't to be found. So we had to actually <laughs> unlock <laughs> That made it even more fun, you know. You could actually walk around going, I know you're somewhere, I know you're somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really good fun. And we're actually in there waiting for everybody to get worked out and worked through. And we have these great big lamps and they only work about 10 minutes. And they actually have, have this sort of... Um, you're probably technical, you know about these lamps. They, they push in a rod and it burns very, very bright, mm. right? A little bit like Blade Runner and an android burns bright but dies early. Good film that, wasn't it, eh? Anyway, these only burn for about, I think, 10, 15 minutes. And they have to have two electricians by union standard with them to change these burning things. Right? Uh, and there's two electricians there. And I was at one side of the studio and there's an almighty, woo! Everybody's shouting out, wow, got to find out what that is. So I run forward and find out that one electrician has actually stood on the wrong side <laughs> of a false tree trunk and is falling into the mud, this goo that R2 gets thrown out of. And everybody shouted and making a fuss about it and all think it's really, really funny, right? And he pulls him out and he's covered. And they take him away. Well, while this is happening, uh, Luke Skywalker, Hamilton, is in his trailer outside and he obviously must have heard this great big fuss 
and asked what had happened. And they gave him a basic idea that somebody had had a slight accident. So he comes out and he's waiting for the directors, he's waiting for everybody, takes a bit of mud, places on his... Uh, makes him look a little bit better, right? Gets all the muscles showing there. And he's walking back and forward saying, no director, no producer, what's going on? And he's looking up like this. <laughs> and we've got the, all the other props that are working. And he makes the wrong turn. <laughs> Slum. Straight in his mouth, up to here. <laughs> and he looks up and he sort of clicked to him. That's what they're making the noise about. <laughs> <laughs> right? So he looks up to the other electrician, is there, because the other one's changing. We've got rid of one already, haven't we? And he goes, Well. <laughs> so the electrician looks around and goes, Wee! <laughs> Because if you upset these guys, you're off the set for a couple of days, right? So nobody wanted to say nothing. Yeah. So all we got was a wee. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks past me and said, never happened to John Barrymore. <laughs> so that's my last story. All right, well, fair enough. Well, uh, we, 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 we did say we're going to end at 8 o'clock. So sorry, Meg, not to be able to ask you any question. But um, Tony, thank you so much for this evening. It's been we really great fun. It. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. very much. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much. And, and, and thanks, thanks also to, to, to Bob, who built, uh, who built this R2-D2 unit as a builder. And, 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 and Tony was saying it's one of the best he's seen uh, in, in recent memory. So thank you very much for doing this. And appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Okay.